them how glad you are that they are here and remind them that God loves you and there is nothing you can do about it. Good morning. I love you. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. All right. We have some opportunities for ministry coming up. The first one is this afternoon at 5 o'clock at Kuwaitan United Methodist Church. They are having a concert, and uh, there will be refreshments and a love offering. So um, I saw the pastor for Kuwaitan United Methodist Church Thursday. We had a district meeting down in Cadillac with all the pastors, and he was super excited about that. And so I'd encourage you to go check it out. Um, also, we had a great concert. It didn't look like that many people would be there at the beginning, by, but by the end, it was pretty darn packed for uh, Michael Hewlett and uh, James Holzos, I think is how you say it. Every time I get nervous about saying his last name. Um, and the good news is they are going to be back Labor Day playing in the tennis park at Alden. So if you didn't get to catch them then, or you did get to catch them when we had them here in Central Lake, you can go see them that Monday at 3, I believe. Um, also, looking for today, there is a celebration of Mara Vitar's life at 4 at Brownwood on Torch Lake Drive. Uh, also this week on Tuesday, there is a SPRC meeting in Alden at 7 o'clock, so if you're on SPRC, um, you can go for that, and looking forward, our first mistake dinner is September 10th, and our pasty making is going to be the week of October 17th and 24th. So I think that, oh, and then uh, Phyllis is out at Meadowbrook, and I went to go see her this week, and they had a big sign saying they were COVID positive. Uh, so I didn't get to go see her, but Jill said probably by the end of this week, beginning of next week, they should clear up there. So um, if you want to go visit Phyllis or send her a card, the information is right there in the bulletin. All right. Are there any announcements that I'm missing? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, each of the three will get about $200. It's not collect very much. So, but the boys collected in their check chair for sixty five. Oh, nice! But we're going to give them a third of the other. Yeah. So money from the concert is going to the Central Lake and the Ellsworth Food Pantry, and then um, also a little bit for Michael and James. So, all right. Are there any other announcements? If not, let's begin our worship with our opening hymn number 384, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, and we get to have Joyce playing for us. Thank you. 
away from God. We are tempted by trinkets and gadgets. We place our interest in temporal things. But Christ calls us to a higher level. We are called to focus our lives on living as God would have us live. We are called to be open to ways of service and compassion. Amen. Amen. It is time for the children to come back. And you may be seated. Your heart this morning. Carolyn? 
prayers for Gary. His surgery is the 25th of this coming week. And uh, he's been in and out of AFib the past three days. And he's just so tired he cannot eat it. So prayers for Gary. His surgery is this week on the 25th. Um, prayers that all goes well with the surgery and that he's feeling peace as he goes into it. And prayers for him with his aphid that uh, that gets back into the right rhythm and he's feeling better. Lord, in your mercy. What other prayers are on your hearts? Praises to have Joyce back playing. It's always good when I can hear Joyce's music before worship. It puts me right in the right mood for worship. Lord, in your mercy. I would like to have prayers for my brother and his family. My nephew is seriously ill with water. He was paralyzed in a month of his body and his ears. And I would pray for his family. A lot of problems. So prayers for your brother's family yes. and your nephew who who's paralyzed? Mostly. Yes. Mostly yes. paralyzed. Prayers that God would be at work healing him and giving wisdom to his doctors to treat him and Make him better. Lord, in your mercy. What other prayers are in your hearts? Jim? I pray to save Gary for my family that are waiting to come back from God's faith. So, prayers for safe travels for your family as they're coming back from downstate, that uh, God would be with them and keep them safe. And all the travelers on the roads, Lord, in your mercy. What other prayers? If there are no other prayers, let us go to God in silent prayer, knowing that God knows all that's on our hearts and in our minds. Let us pray. Holy and loving God, we give thanks to you for all the ways that you bless us. God, we lift up to you all those people whose names we have spoken aloud, those whose names are on our hearts, and those whose names we don't even know, because we know that you know who they are and that you are with them. God, as we are apart from one another, as we go about our weeks and as we travel, God, we pray that you are with each one of us, bringing us comfort and peace, making us your people in the world, using us to do your work and share your love. God, we pray for our neighbors, both near and far. We pray especially for those around our country who are dealing with flooding. We pray for the first responders, for the families of those who've lost loved ones and for those who are going to have to rebuild their homes and their communities. We pray your safety on them, and we pray that the floods would recede and that our weather would be better and safer, and that we would be good stewards of creation, that we might care for our planet in ways to make our weather better. And God, we pray for our communities and our state and our nation and our world. We pray that you would give wisdom to our leaders. We pray that they would have hearts of peace, hearts of wisdom, and to do all the things to care for the least of these in our world. We ask all these things in your son's name. Amen. <coughs> Our hymn is number 454, Open My Eyes That I May See. Please rise as you are able. <laughs> Thank you. 
lesson is from Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the family inheritance with me. But he said to him, Friend, who set me to be a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Then he told them a parable. The land of a rich man produced abundantly, and he thought to himself, what should I do, for I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, I will do this. I will pull down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So it is with those who store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich towards God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. to God. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, may my words be your words to all who are listening. Amen. Now, I put a lot of time into my sermons. The average I put in is about an hour for each minute that I talk. And when they told us that in seminary, you know, we asked, well, how long should we work on sermons for uh, doing them? And when they said an hour for each minute, we thought they were crazy. But it really is pretty much spot on if you count the time of figuring out uh, what the worship plan is going to be and stuff. And, um, but the thing is, no matter how much time I put into my sermons, a lot of people miss the point or else they forget it by the time they get to the car out there. Um, and a lot of times it's me, because if you ask me by the time I've gotten into my car what I just preached on, sometimes I don't even remember, so I'm not even picking on you guys. But my only consolation with that is that Jesus had the same problem. He had been preaching about hypocrisy and hell and unforgivable sin, but this guy in the crowd, he didn't get any of it. So he shouts out, teacher, get my brother to divide my inheritance with me. And it wasn't really the first time that this sort of thing had happened to Jesus. It was for the second time in just a little while that Jesus was asked to deal with a family argument. First, it was Martha and Mary, and now it's these two brothers who are arguing over an inheritance. And according to the law in Jesus' day, the elder brother would get about two-thirds of the inheritance, and the younger brother would get one-third of it. But this guy, he's not asking Jesus to listen to both sides and make a righteous judgment. He's asking Jesus to take sides with him against his brother. And people had a way of wanting to, uh, Jesus to put their relatives in line, right? I don't remember any scriptures that talk about Jesus coming to settle your family disputes. It was nowhere back in Isaiah the prophecies, right? <clears throat> and so what this man didn't want, he didn't want what was fair. He didn't want what was right. This guy was greedy, and his share wasn't enough for him. And so there's two ways to get enough, right? One is to accumulate more, and the other is to want less. But it tells us this guy is greedy. And I think we are, too, all of us, if we confess our, our sins, right? As Americans, we can't pass up a deal. I've heard it said once that the only reason American families don't own an elephant is because an elephant has never been offered for a dollar down with easy weekly payments. Right? And the fact of the matter is, even the poorest people in the United States, people who are getting assistance from the government in our country, who we consider people in poverty, even those people, all of us, are in the top 1% of wealth in the world. So no matter how much we think we have or we don't have, we are incredibly blessed in our country. And so Jesus tells this story, and we think it's about rich people, right? You know, like Bill Gates and Oprah Winfrey's and the Powerball winners of the world. But the man in Jesus' story, he's called a fool, but he wasn't a fool because he was rich. 
he had gotten what he had honestly and through working his land and having people work for him. He was a fool because he forgot what was really important. He was a fool because he had decided for himself what he thought was important. He was a fool because he thought to himself, I have done all of this. I will pull down these barns and I'm going to build bigger ones. Everything is about him and nothing is about God. He only thought about himself. And if you go through and count like I did, there's 11 times that the words I and my are used in this scripture. But here's the thing. We don't own anything, do we? Whatever we have, it's lent to us by God. Or I've heard it said, too, which it doesn't put God in the equation. We don't inherit anything from our parents. We borrow it from our children and grandchildren, right? And we, we are stewards for what God owns. And so, like, in English, American English, we hear that word steward when we, in wine stewards, right? That's about the only way I can think of that word being used in American English. Like, in Europe, they have castles with lords, and those castles have stewards. And that steward doesn't own the castle, right? He takes care of it for the lord. And the same thing with a wine steward in the United States. Like, I am not a wine drinker so much, and I also don't go to fancy restaurants with wine stewards and, you know, the whole shebang. But I am told by people who do do that is the wine steward will come out and show you the bottle and have you sniff the cork and tell you all about this. But does that wine steward own that bottle of wine that he's trying to get you to have? No. He doesn't own it, does he? Who owns it? (laughs) Yeah, the winery or the restaurant, whoever it is, he's just the guy who's taking care of the wine, right? He doesn't own that wine. I mean, that's kind of the best thing I can think, because steward isn't really a word we use in modern American English, right? And so we are stewards for what God owns. And Jesus, he doesn't condemn this man for eating, drinking, and being merry, which I think is great news for all of us. And he doesn't even condemn him for actually being rich. And I almost was very tempted to, instead of the sermon title being, Who Needs a Bigger Barn? Have it be, Who Needs a Bigger Cottage? Because how many of you have seen these adorable little 1920s, 1930s, maybe one-bedroom, two-bedroom cottages on Torch Lake or Intermediate Lake, what do they do with them? They buy that property for a lot of money. What do they do with those cottages? They tear them down, right? They're just tear downs. And they put up a great, big, fancy mansion, um, which I went on a fire department run, and there was a couple, it was a beautiful house. And it was probably bigger than our house, which we have a pretty good-sized parsonage, right? Um, And the lady said, oh yeah, we just bought this cabin. I mean, the house was brand new and beautiful. It was one of those just gorgeous Torch Lake homes. And I thought to myself, well, that's a really different way of looking at it, right? Uh, You know, it probably had six, seven bedrooms, and I don't know how many bathrooms, and all the the nicest amenities. But Jesus wasn't condemning rich people or even people who put those level, you know, maybe somebody's got a big family like ours and they're not going to fit in a one-bedroom 1930s cabin. But if you look through the Bible, there's lots of wealthy people in the Bible that Jesus doesn't condemn because Abraham was a wealthy man. He had flocks of sheep and herds of cattle, which is how they measured wealth back then. Jacob had a multitude of sheep and cattle and camels. David, King David, he was a wealthy king. All you need to read is how much he set aside to build the temple, to know how much money he had. But even David couldn't match the wealth of his son, King Solomon, because first king says, King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. So Jesus didn't condemn people for having money or being wealthy or being rich. Why did he condemn all those people I just listed? Because they were rich towards God, right? They took care of things. They put more trust in God than they did their fortunes and possessions. And they used those to honor God. 
You know, uh, Saints Ambrose, Augustine, and ba Basil. That was why I call him Basil. It's Saint Basil. He called they all of them called building bigger barns theft from the poor, which I think is really hard to hear. If you know, because we all have a lot as Americans, right? But it's a matter of doing what you have. There's, I've heard at some of these beautiful mansions on Torch Lake that they have all kinds of charity events in them, like the, what is the, the tea party for breast cancer that they do? Is it an Antrim County thing? I know they had it at one of those big fancy houses, which I think is great. If, you know, just like we like to use our church buildings to do good things for Jesus. But, um, Jesus didn't condemn the people for being wealthy. He condemned them for being greedy. Somebody asked a, a rich guy, and I want to say it was uh, John D. Rockefeller, what it would take to make him truly happy. And do you know what his answer was? One more dollar. Can you imagine being John D. Rockefeller and wanting one more dollar? Because he doesn't have enough. Jesus said, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or your body, what you will wear. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? But we worry. I think sometimes we worry too much. And if we let our worry run our lives, we can end up running after money and possessions. We can even end up arguing over the amount of money we get in inheritance. You guys have been around a little bit. How many of you have heard somebody around you talking about the problems in their family over arguing over an inheritance or how much somebody got or maybe you know somebody who won a good amount of money in the lottery or by selling something? How many of you have heard those, those problems with inheritances and, you know, people are talking to their sister or their brother because of the way everything got divided up from mom or dad or whatever? I mean, it happens all the time. 2,000 years later, we're not much better than this guy, right? And so Jesus identifies this problem that all of us get tempted by, which is greed. And then he prescribes the solution for us, which is faith. The cure to greed is for us to realize that it's about God supplying all of our needs. And recently on my Facebook memories, if you're not on Facebook, they have a little button you can push it up, tell you what happened on your Facebook, what you posted, all the years that you have been on Facebook. So everything that happened on um, August 21st will be in a little section in my Facebook that I can go back and look at. And Earlier this week, it came up uh, something that happened a few years ago to us while we were driving home from camping up north. Before we knew there was a central lake here in Alden, we had a tire on our camper shred. We had a 30-foot travel trailer right in the middle of nowhere on 127 on our way home. And we had done the shredded camper tire thing more than once in the middle of nowhere on a dirt shoulder. And it is just all around not fun because the jack sinks in the dirt on the shoulder. But there happened to be a trailer shop on the other side of the highway. We broke down right there where that, is it Uncle John's cider mill? That great big cider mill there on 127. But, and there's a little trailer um, tire shop across the way. And so a guy happened to be there at 5.30 on a Saturday, and he came across, he saw us there on the side of the road, and he brought a floor jack and a battery-powered um, lug nut gun, and he got our tire changed with Scott in no time. Now, if Scott was having to do the old car jack, pump it up and get it up and try to get it out of the sand and stuff, it would have taken forever. And the guy, he wouldn't take any of our money. He only asked us to come back and when we needed new trailer tires, to buy a set of eight five trailer tires from him um, when we did that, when we replaced him. And I have to tell you, I grumbled the entire way home about what a miserable time it was because Lillian was really little at that time and hated being in her car seat and so she fussed and grumbled about it the whole trip. 
And with bathroom breaks and breaking down, the four hour trip took us like seven hours getting home and a car full of kids. And then after as I was home, as I was getting ready for bed, and I was looking, I realized I was looking at all those things the wrong way. Because God had blessed us and brought us home safely. We had a wonderful vacation. We had a nice camper to camp in and wonderful family to spend vacation with. And most of all, in the middle of nowhere, when we had a trailer tire shred, God sees fit to have it happen right across the, from a trailer shop with a kind soul who helped us out and got us back on the road. God was taking care of us even when the laws of physics were not going our way. And I think it's a good illustration of how sometimes God uses people to answer prayers. I say it all the time. I mean, I think, look at us. We've got money that's going to our local food pantries. There is somebody who is praying to figure out, for God to figure out how they can feed their kids this month, right? And by us sending, you know, Carolyn doesn't feel like it's a lot of money, but that little bit of money is going to help feed somebody and help answer their prayers of worrying about where their next meal is going to come from. And then later in Luke 12, Jesus says, Consider how the lilies grow. They don't labor or spin, yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? God's always looking out for us and our needs. And then he says, but seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. And so Jesus is telling us, are you worried about, are you tempted by worry? Are you tempted by greed? Then sell your stuff and give it to the poor, which is kind of, kind of what we do at the rummage sale, right? That some of you have helped with setting up and Sorting, which I didn't get to mention, the rummage sale, the women's rummage sale that ladies from this church have helped with too, they made $10,101. And all that money goes back into our communities. It's going to go to our food pantries and mom and tots and Good Samaritan and, and a bunch of other good community organizations that help people. What Jesus is telling us here is if money controls you, give it away. Because the problem with greed is it makes us worship our stuff. And I've been working on that with myself because we have too much stuff at the Wagner House. I'm sure you can imagine with eight kids and I'm sentimental, I want to hold on to everything. I've been really struggling with how do I get rid of stuff and letting things go to go bless somebody else. That's been the best way for me to let go of stuff that I don't want to let go of is for me to think of it going out and blessing others. Give it away, says Jesus. So last week, I gave you homework to do. Did anybody do their homework and write a letter to themselves about um, how they wanted to grow closer in their walk with God and the ways that they would like to see our church um, being Jesus in our community? Um, yes? No? Well, guess what? Oh, all right. I put a stamp on Oh, you didn't even have to put a stamp. I was going to buy the stamps myself. But so Scott did his homework. The rest of you can maybe work on that this week because I think, oh, I see Jill with an envelope too. Yeah, the stamp, the stamp. All right. Good job. Yeah, I <laughs> Scott didn't do his homework. <laughs> So I did half of it. I only got it half done. I got to work out the other half this week. But I encourage you to do that. Set aside time with Jesus this week and time with God to decide how you want to grow in your faith in the next year, how you want to grow closer to Jesus, and the ways that you would like to see our churches, our churches, our church, bleh, our church being Jesus in the world and growing closer to God. You know, <clears throat> Paul explained, you don't have to be rich to be contented. He wrote, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, 
whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Do you notice Paul doesn't say contentedness comes from how much money or stuff he had or one more dollar like Rockefeller said? He explains that his satisfaction in life comes only when we turn to Jesus and give him his strength. So now I have a trivia question for you. Who knows the name of Roy Rogers' wife? Dale. Dale. What's her last name? Yes. Oh, very good. You guys did know. So Dale Evans was once interviewed, and she was asked to explain why she was so happy all of the time. And she said, all my life, I searched for the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, but I found what I really need at the foot of the cross. Isn't that a great quote? Oh, last week, the benediction in the bulletin, it was one of the best-known John Wesley quotes. Almost everybody, it seems, knows that quote. They don't all know it's from John Wesley, um, but it's a pretty well-known quote. But have I told you before my favorite John Wesley quote? Probably not. You're all shaking your head in the middle. My favorite John Wesley quote is this. Beloved, money is like manure. When you pile it up, it stinks to high heaven. When you spread it around, it does a world of good. So beloved, how are we spreading our manure? Let's go spread some manure out in the world. Amen. All right. It is time for our morning offering. Time to spread some manure. Nobody better put a cow caddy in the plate. That's all I'm saying.
Now and forever, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen.